Hey fam, it's Mariah, and welcome to Calvary Conversations, where we simplify God's Word to reach today's culture by casting down arguments through real, radical testimonies and biblical conversations. Now let's get started. Welcome to Calvary Conversations. My name is Mariah, and I'm here with Chrissa Garcia. And today we are interviewing Todd Nettleton. So Todd, thank you so much for joining us today. Thanks for having me. I've been looking forward to it. Awesome. So for those who don't know who you are, and also I feel like everyone knows what, if they hear Voice of the Martyrs and what that is, but can you just share who you are and what you do? Sure. Let, let me introduce Voice of the Martyrs first. Uh, that That's far more important than me. Uh, but Voice of the Martyrs is a ministry to persecuted Christians. So for more than 50 years, uh, our ministry has been helping Christians who face persecution for doing a lot of the things that we take for granted, for going to church, gathering with other believers, for having a Bible, uh, for sharing their faith with somebody else. So we take that for granted, but Christians in more than 70 countries pay a price for that. The Voice of the Martyrs seeks to help them uh, through kind of three main ways. We, we talk about persecution response, which is helping those directly affected by persecution. Maybe that is providing medical care. Maybe that is rebuilding a house that was burned down. Uh, or maybe it's helping somebody get out of a situation where they're in danger, uh, relocating them within their own country. Mm -hmm. uh, then we talk about Bibles. Every year, Voice of the Martyrs distributes more than a million Bibles into hostile and restricted countries. Uh, and then we talk about frontline ministry, which I like to call them pre-persecuted Christians mm -hmm. because they are doing ministry in a place where Christians are persecuted. Maybe they haven't been persecuted yet, but they are likely to be at some point. And Voice of the Martyrs provides tools and training and encouragement for those believers to help them, to help their ministries there. Uh, and then in, in the U.S., we, we do what I'm doing now. We tell the stories of persecuted Christians to make sure the body of Christ knows what's happening so that we can pray for our brothers and sisters, so we can encourage them, we can stand with them, uh, but also to encourage our own faith. You know, as we see brothers and sisters who would rather die than give up their faith in Christ, uh, I think the natural question that we all ask ourselves is, okay, well, what would I do in that situation? And, and that's such a great question, uh, because I think then we go to the Lord and we say, Lord, I know what the right answer is. I want to say, man, I would stand strong. No one could stop me, uh, but I'm not sure I'm that strong. Lord, help me to be stronger. Help me to grow in my faith. So that's my part of the ministry is sharing the stories of persecuted Christians. I do that. Uh, I host our podcast and radio show, weekly radio show. Uh, I also write on occasion for our free magazine. Uh, and I've written a book called When Faith is Forbidden that has 40 of my favorite stories from persecuted Christians. Um, so my part of the ministry is really sharing those stories. Mm, that's awesome. So I know Carissa, she has um, been able to like even look at your bio and everything. So um, she was saying that you were a sports writer actually before. And so the question is, how did you... Were you, and then you were also a missionary kid and grew up, did you grow up in Papua New Guinea or what did that? Uh, we lived in Papua New Guinea from, the, we went there when I was 12 and we came home when I was 16. So I was there for four years, right? Those kind of key years right there in my early teens. Uh, and then after I went to college, my parents went to Africa and later they were in Guyana. So uh, I had the chance to visit some of those places, but I never lived there. Uh, but yeah, I, w I was a missionary kid. That certainly impacted my life. Uh, and really, when people ask me, you know, how did you start working at Voice of the Martyrs? Yeah. Uh, I start when I was 12 years old and we moved to Papua New Guinea because that that really planted a lot of seeds in my life that right now are producing fruit at Voice of the Martyrs. And, uh, you know, I, I learned how to get on an airplane and go someplace I've never been and mm -hmm. don't speak the language and, you know, figure out how to find the bathroom, figure out how to find the hotel, yeah. uh, figure out how to communicate at least a little bit with the people uh, but also an understanding that there are followers of Jesus that don't look like me, they don't talk like me, they're from a completely different background than I'm from, but they love Jesus, and I love Jesus, so so we're brothers, we're sisters, and um, that that understanding is really foundational to everything I do today at Voice mm -hmm. of the Martyrs. Amen. You have a question, Krista? Yeah, so um, going along with that as well— um, because it kind of just answered the question of like, how did you go from 
like being the sports writer to, you know, um, walking in that call of like coming alongside the persecuted church. And I feel like that's a very, I don't want to say like particular calling, but really like to hear from the Lord to like come alongside this in particular. And so I guess my question is like, have you always had like this kind of stirring or a burden specifically to come alongside persecuted Christians and the persecuted church? Because I feel like that's even different than just doing missionary work or Mm -hmm. whether that's here or overseas, but to come alongside something that's so hear those stories. Yeah. Like radical. Like how, how did the Lord reveal that to you? And and how did that come about? You know, I I think it certainly is different and I think it certainly is a calling. It it is a, it is a passion that I have. uh, And the Lord has kind of fired that passion. But, you know, again, I would point back to as a very young (laughs) person uh, one of the things that my dad did at our house is uh, he read my brother and I, I have two brothers now, but at the time I just had one brother and, and my brother and I, my dad read us uh, the biographies of great missionaries. Um, and so Lords of the Earth by Don Richardson was one I very much remember, very much impacted by that. Uh, Bruchko by Bruce Olson. He read that book to us, very impacting. Um, and so even as a nine, 10, 11 year old boy, I had the idea that someone who did great things for God was a hero and someone who was willing to set aside their comfort to answer the call of God was a hero. Uh, And so I still believe that today. And the fun thing is now I'm 53, I get to go sit down with these heroes and ask them questions and hear their stories and interview them. So I do think that some of those seeds were planted very early on in my life even if I didn't necessarily say, well, I want to grow up and work at Voice of the Martyrs, or I want to grow up and and work with persecuted Christians, I definitely saw uh, bold heroes of the faith as heroic figures and people whose stories deserve to be told, deserve to be heard. And then, um, you know, we talked about being a sports writer, and it is a kind of a weird transition to go from, you know, going to a high school football game and writing a story about it to, um, you know, going to the Middle East and interviewing persecuted Christians. But again, there were some seeds that were planted through that process. And uh, one of them, frankly, was my writing skills improved dramatically because uh, I had to write every day. I, you know, they expected a story and I learned how to write fast. Um, if the football game gets over at 930 and you hang around to talk to the coach afterwards and then you go back to the office and the press rolls at midnight, you don't have time to have writer's block. You got to write your story. You got to get it done. Uh, and so that's a skill set that I have that I learned at the newspaper that still serves me well today. When I need to write something, I can do it usually quite quickly. Um, and so, again, the, there were just some seeds along the way that God was planting in my life. And I didn't know at the time how he would use them later. Uh, I certainly didn't anticipate, uh, you know, the, the platform that he's given me today. I didn't anticipate all that I'd be doing. My wife loves to tell a story early on in our marriage. So we've been married almost 31 years now. Early on in our marriage, I told her one day that I thought it would be cool if I could host a radio show. I thought, you know, hey, I like to talk. Wouldn't it be cool if I could host a radio show? And she's just kind of like, oh, yeah, Todd, yeah, that's great. I hope that works out for you, thinking there's no way that'll ever happen. Um, But I'll never forget the day that my boss here at Voice of the Martyrs came into my office and said, hey, uh, we want to start a radio show and we want you to host it. Uh, It was just literally like God planted this gift in my lap uh, and brought that dream that had been in my heart to fruition all these years later. So it was just an amazing gift to be able to do that. Um, but again, I look, I look back at those seeds and I see how God has brought fruition to them. And I hope that's encouraging to people who are listening that you might be in a seed planting time right now and it might not be fun and it might not be comfortable and you might not be where you want to be or where you think you should be, but maybe God is planting some of those seeds in your life that are going to bring fruit later on. Thank you so much for sharing that because it it does encourage us, you know, those who are in America, we're, we're very privileged, we're very blessed, and just being able to know that God can still use us, and we, like, I think we just look at a martyr and we think, oh, they have to die, but a martyr is a faithful witness unto death, so mm-hmm. we are going to testify of God's goodness like what you're doing, so we just want to encourage you, like, thank you for doing that, thank you for getting those stories, how difficult that might be to hear those, you know, to be a part of that, but yet how encouraging, like, 
certain stories that I've heard from other interviews you did. This one lady, what was her name? So it was a story where she was in China and went to prison and you're translating what prison was like. <laughs> Sister yeah, Tong. Share that story I love that us? story. I would love to. So Sister Tong was in prison in China for hosting a house church meeting at her home. So at that time, uh, the the Chinese government, the Chinese police were raiding house churches. Uh, they typically wouldn't arrest everybody, but they would arrest the host because it was their house. They should know better. Uh, and so Sister Tong was arrested. She went off to prison for six months. And uh, we were there. Actually, my wife was with me on the trip, and we were there just a, a few weeks after she had gotten out of prison. So she was very fresh out of prison. And uh, I get the chance to sit down with her. I know I'm going to come back. I'm going to do interviews like this one. I'm going to write a story for our magazine. And so, uh, you know, if you're going to write a story, what's the first thing you need? You need the setting. Uh, and so, Sister Tong, tell me about the prison. And in my mind, I'm thinking, okay, let's paint a picture of how miserable this Chinese prison was. Tell me how hard the bed was. Tell me how big the rats were. Tell me how terrible the food was. Let's really paint a picture for, for our Voice of the Martyrs readers about how miserable you were in prison. And the translator translates my question and Sister Tong gets what I can only describe as a heavenly mm -hmm. smile on her face. She says something in Chinese and the translator says, oh, yes, that was a wonderful time. <laughs> and, and I looked at the translator because I'm like, no, she must not have understood the question because, you know, you never no one's ever going to describe prison as a wonderful time. That doesn't even make sense. Um, you know, are you sure you understood the question? Are you sure she understood? Yes, yes, she understood. Yes, this is her answer. And I said, okay, Sister Tong, you're going to have to tell me, you know, how, how could six months in prison be a wonderful time? And the thing she told me, and I'll never forget it, she said, Jesus was with me in that prison cell in a way that I've never experienced before. He was so close. He was so real. It was so personal how he ministered to me in that mm -hmm. prison cell. And the other thing she said, she said, you know, there were ladies in my cell with me. And when I got there, they did not know Jesus, but they know him now. I got to be the one to introduce them to him. And so, you know, Jesus was with me. Jesus gave me a ministry to do. How could that not be wonderful? I mean, what what is there that's not wonderful about that? And the challenge that I took from Sister Tong, and I actually tell her story in my book, and, and the challenge that I think she gives us is, okay, if the situation that I'm in right now, if Jesus is with me, and we know that Jesus said he would be with us even to the ends of the earth, if Jesus is with me, if Jesus gives me a ministry to do, how can this not be a wonderful situation? Even if I didn't want to be here, even if it's hard, even if it's a hospital room or an emergency room or the unemployment line or whatever frustrating circumstance, I think we need to open our eyes and say, okay, is Jesus with me? Yeah, he said he would be okay, what ministry is he giving me to do in this mm -hmm. situation? It, she never could have reached those ladies in prison without going to prison. That's that's the only way that happens. And so, you know, maybe there's somebody in the emergency room that needs to hear about mm -hmm. Jesus. Maybe there's somebody that you're going to encounter in this circumstance that's ready to hear about Jesus. Let's keep our eyes open and, and sort of borrow Sister mm -hmm. Tong's glasses and try to watch for, okay, is Jesus here? Is he giving me a ministry to do? then this can be a wonderful time, even if I wouldn't have wanted to be here. I wouldn't have wished for this, but he can make it a wonderful time. Um, I love that you said that because my husband is very opposite than me. He is sees everything as like, oh, I'm sure that this is what the Lord wants us to do. We're sitting, changing our name in the social security office where it was terrible, and, and we had to wait forever and all that, and I was so upset. And he's like, let's just use this opportunity to like, see if the Lord brings like a divine appointment. And he did. But like, it's just how you look at life. Like, yeah, we always joke of like, oh, there's optimistic people and pessimistic people. But really as a Christian, we should all have not just a, like the new age, like, oh, positive vibes, but we should look towards like what the Lord's God, what is your will in this? What are you doing in this? Like, we might not be able to have a story that we're like, oh, I don't feel like it's good enough to be like on like voice of the martyr but it's something that we are being a faithful witness to the lord in whatever situation and so um and one of the things that happens let me enter one of the things that happens as you see god open those doors like you're in the social security office and he does open a door the next time you get in that circumstance you're more willing to see the open yeah. you're ready to see the open door you're like hey last time yeah. look at the, what god did and 
Uh, I think of a Christian named David Bile that I interviewed who lived in Turkey for a number of years. And he literally said when he saw the police knocking on his door, he would get excited because he was like, somebody at the police wow. station is ready to hear about Jesus. Because why else would God take me to the police station right now if someone wasn't ready? And, and he had lived that out. He had seen that happen so many times that literally the police knocked on his door and he like gets this feeling of excitement, like, hey, good, somebody's ready to hear the gospel. That's how we can live too. We can have that same sense of anticipation. We just need to learn how to keep our eyes open and, and see the doors that God is presenting to us. Yes. Yeah, so the next question. Um, so in I'm going to kind of blend two of them together, but like in terms of demographics, um, like what age, age range do you see of like Christian converts or like Christians like rising up and being bold in their faith from all the stories and testimonies that you've heard? And then paired with that, is it also hard for you to hear of all of those stories and even like the final words of those who have been martyred when you get to interview their families, but how to separate that from the Western church today and how we do have it easy and mm -hmm. we're not facing the persecution that they're facing. We can come to church. We can pray. We can have, you know, worship nights out in a courtyard somewhere, you know, go on and evangelize and we're not being imprisoned for our faith. So for now, yeah, for now. <laughs> it, Sometimes it is very hard to hear someone's story. Um, I'm, I'm going there and I'm asking them about what may have been the worst day of their life. And so I, I, I really see it as a sacred privilege to do that and, and a sacred thing that they would say, okay, yeah, I'm going to tell you. Let's, mm -hmm. let's go back and relive the worst day of my life together. Uh, well, you know, who would want to do that? But the thing that's encouraging is to see how how God brings good out of it. Um, I'll never forget it. And I always tell people who are just finding out about Voice of the Martyrs Radio, if you've never listened before, go search for the story of Sister Amber, uh, who was detained in Tibet. And so Sister Amber has this amazing testimony, and I, I won't try to break it all down, but, but she was imprisoned by the Chinese police in Tibet. She was uh, abused by them. And she's telling me the story. She's crying. I'm crying. We're, we're both crying. But, but out of this, God did some amazing things. And, and God was present with her in the midst of that persecution. In fact, she really sensed the Lord in the midst of that really hard time, the Lord saying, hey, remember, they're not persecuting you. They're persecuting me. And the Lord asked her in that situation, can I borrow your body to receive my persecution? And, and Sister Amber testified that she said, yes, Lord, you can borrow my body. So she endures this terrible situation. And yet in the midst of that, the Holy Spirit is ministering to her and speaking to her and encouraging her. And so that's the part that carries me through the hardness of the stories is, hey, God was still there. I don't want to go back and, and talk about that story. And I feel bad in some ways, asking her to relive that. But hey, look what God did in the midst of that. Let, let's talk about what God did. And so that's the part that encourages me, e even in the midst of hard stories, is, is God is still at work. As far as your question about demographics, I, I have interviewed very old persecuted Christians, and I have interviewed very young persecuted Christians. Um, and, and I think I don't think you can point to an age group and say, well, this is the group that God is doing the most with because he is doing uh, amazing things. I, I just, we just had an interview on VOM radio a couple weeks ago with a Christian from central Asia. And he told the story of coming to faith. He went home and told his mother, Hey, I'm a follower of Jesus. And his mother was like, Oh, this is the worst thing. This is terrible. You're a terrible son. You've brought shame on our family. You'll never find a wife now. Nobody's going to want to marry an uh, infidel. Um, wait till your dad gets home. That, that was kind of her, her, you know, the end of the story. Wait till your dad gets home. He's really going to take care of you. So they sit down to dinner that, that night, and Maxud, the guy I was interviewing, tells his father. Uh, his mom kind of says, well, hey, Maxud has something to tell you. And, and Maxud says, well, father, I've, I've decided to follow Jesus. And his father looked at him, and he, and he tells a story on, on VOM Radio. His father looked at him and said, Son, I started following Jesus two years ago, 
I didn't know how to tell you. I didn't know how to bring that up. I didn't know how to tell you that I was doing that. But I've been praying for two years that you would come and that you would know Jesus as well. Uh, and so, you know, multi-generations coming to faith. Uh, one of the things that I would ask people to pray for, and this is particularly true in the Islamic world, a lot of the persecution is is yeah. from your family. It's from your dad. It's from your older brother. Um, and so one of the things we can pray is that whole families will come to faith at the same time um, because instantly then there's a church, there's a community, and also you kind of avoid some of that family persecution that is so common in, in yeah, those countries. I'm, I'm thankful you brought that up because I remember the story that really impacted me like as a kid and reading Voice of the Martyrs and the story of this young girl who, you know, she gave her life to the Lord and she she was killed by her father, like literally was a ch young child. These missionaries told her about the Lord, went home, shared that, killed. And when the missionaries holding her in her hands, like in her new little white dress, she's just saying, it's okay. Like I get to see Jesus. Like she was just, and that is where even in America, we see that with families, like family. It's so hard to stand up for Christ in your own family because, you know, they're the closest people to you, but yet that's why I believe the Bible talks about it so much that it says like you will have the divisions. It says, I didn't come to bring peace, but a sword. It's talking about family. It says, who's my mother? Who's my father? Those who do the will of God. And so it it's hard because in America, we're like, oh, we don't, you know, suffer anything like they do. But standing up for Christ just in our own family and speaking the truth. And that might be something what the Bible says, like the Bible talks against fornication. And he talks about, you know, against like homosexuality. Are we going to stand up or are we just going to let the world decide what the truth is? And because they're family. No, we want to stand up for what the Bible says and what. And even if that means we lose our family, if they call themselves Christians, but are not following. So can you give encouragement to those in America right now who, like we said, that's why I said the statement. Yeah, we have these freedoms for now, because what would you say to those in America who are like, oh, it's fine, at least I don't live in China, or at least I don't live in Iraq or anything like that. What would you say to us to not be, you know, soft in these snowflakes that my dad calls us, especially us younger generations who are always offended? What encouragement would you give us in America? You know, I think the, the encouragement I would give is that all of us are called to be faithful. Uh, we don't get to pick our circumstances all the time, but the call is still the same. It's be faithful, follow Jesus, do what he asks you to do, do what he calls you to do. And uh, I'll never forget a conversation with a Chinese pastor. And, and he said, you know, in China, Satan uses persecution against mm -hmm. the church. But in America, Satan uses prosperity yeah, against exactly. the church. And both of them are can be tools of Satan but also both of them are things that God can use to build his kingdom. Um, and so I think, I think just focusing on being faithful, focusing on uh, the call to follow Christ, one of the challenges for us as American Christians, and, and I'm in this boat too, so I'm, I'm non-persecuted. I go to church quite freely every Sunday. It, there's nobody pointing a gun at me. One of our challenges is a lot of us came to faith hearing a message of, Come to Jesus, and he's going to make your life better. He's going to meet your needs. You're probably going to get a better job. You're going to have a bigger house. And just come to Jesus because he wants to make your life here on earth better. Our brothers and sisters in hostile and restricted nations, they hear a very different gospel. It is Jesus wants to save you. He wants to be with you in whatever circumstance you're in here, and he wants to take you to eternity with him but your life here on earth might get worse. <laughs> in fact, it might get a lot worse. And so the challenge for us is when hardship comes to us, and it will come, we're kind of knocked off course. We're like, well, what happened? I thought God was going to make my life better and easier and more fun and, and more profitable. And, and how could this bad thing be happening to me? Whereas a Christian who came to faith in a hostile and restricted nation, they just think, well, yeah, this is what I knew was going to happen. You know, I, I knew following Jesus would cause problems, and now my older brother has beat me up, or now I've gotten arrested. This is what I knew was going to happen. It's a little different mindset, and, and I think we can learn the lesson from these brothers and sisters to say, hey, yes, troubles are going to come, 
that doesn't change God's call to be faithful. It just makes it maybe a little more difficult in that season. But the promise of God is that he will, will be with us. And sometimes we, sen- like Sister Tong, we sense him more. We sense him better in those hard situations, in those difficult times. So, uh, again, the call is be faithful regardless of the challenges, regardless of the obstacles. And I hope that we can encourage American Christians Yes, we have so many blessings. We have so much freedom. Let's take advantage of it. Let's share the gospel with the people around us. Let's let's make sure that we're taking advantage of our freedom. But when hardship comes, let's not be knocked off course. Let's just count on the presence of Christ to carry us through that. I know we only have a a little bit um, more time, but I think that um, we really do want to help support because we. I've heard that you guys hear you know the story of someone being persecuted and then you get the email and then you respond, whether that means you are saying, Hey, I'm going to pay for your hospital bill or that. And so we, we do want to help support. We want to be there. And we also, we want to hear these stories because I think like you said, it's that encouragement that nowadays in the American church, we're told like, Oh, your life's going to get better. But just to count the costs, to realize that actually as a believer, this is what he says that you will experience persecution. You will go through this. And so just encouraging each other that when you go through pain, that doesn't mean God's done with you. That doesn't mean he's mad at you. That means that you get to use this as an opportunity to share the gospel, to share the good news in the midst of that. So um, what are some resources? Uh, I know you even have the radio, um, Voice of the Martyr Radio. You have an app even and the persecution. Is it called persecution.com or? Persecution.com. That is our website. Let me here's what I tell people to do. You know, if, if this is the first time you're hearing about persecuted Christians, the first time you're hearing about Voice of the Martyrs, number one, commit in your heart that you will pray for our brothers and sisters who are suffering. Uh, Hebrews 13.3 says, remember those in prison as if you were in prison with them. If we were the ones in prison, the first thing we'd want to know is that people were praying for us. Um, and so number one, commit your heart to pray for our brothers and sisters who are suffering. That's the first thing they want us to do. It's the first thing they ask us to do. Then number two is educate yourself so that you can pray more effectively. Uh, I think it's easy to say, God bless persecuted Christians, but it's also easy not to say that. And so when it becomes more personal, when it is God bless Pastor Wang Yi, who is serving a nine-year prison sentence in China, then it's much more personal and much more real. So educate yourself so that you can pray more effectively. And this is where Voice of the Martyrs can really help you. I'm glad you mentioned the app. We have an app that literally every day will pull mm-hmm. up a new prayer request. You can actually set a reminder on your phone. Hey, remind me at 3 p.m. I'm going to pray for persecuted Christians. Um, it also has Voice of the Martyrs radio in it. It has a whole bunch of our books and videos in the app. All of that is free. There's also the Voice of the Martyrs magazine, which you can sign up for at persecution.com. VOM Radio, I, I would be remiss if I didn't encourage you to listen to Voice of the Martyrs Radio. Find it wherever you listen to podcasts. But all of those resources are to educate you so that you can pray more effectively. So number one is pray. Number two, educate yourself so that you can pray more effectively. And then number three is whatever God lays on your heart to do, do it. Uh, Because as you're praying and as you're learning more, God's going to put his finger on something and say, hey, I want you to do this. And maybe that's write letters to Christians who are in prison. We we have a website that will help you do that. Uh, Maybe it's host uh, the Voice of the Martyrs virtual event at your church. That's coming up in July. Uh, Maybe it's sponsor Bibles to go into Iran or China or one of these countries. Maybe it's get on an airplane and go to one of these countries. But it all starts as we're praying and as we're educating ourselves and learning more. Then that gives God more to work with to say, hey, okay, now that you know about this, okay, I want you to do that. This is how I want you to get involved. Exactly. And one more question, then we got to end. So this goes back to um, like the app and the website. So you guys like about seven years ago used to do a map of um, missionaries or persecuted Christians and like how to specifically pray. So I had one of those like seven years ago, but I don't think you guys are doing it anymore. So we still do. We still do a prayer map. Uh, Yeah, you can get it. If you sign up for the magazine, it will come in your very first magazine. It comes in the special issue or we send out a new one each January. So every January we redo the prayer map 
Every year we actually reevaluate the different mm -hmm. countries. Okay, is, is it getting better? Is it getting worse? Uh, last year we added four countries to the prayer map because we see more persecution in those four countries. So, uh, but yeah, we still do that prayer map. It's still a key part. And, you know, you pull that out, yeah. put it on your wall the whole year long. It will mm -hmm. help you to pray. Well, thank you so much for joining us. Do you have any closing thoughts before we end? Follow Jesus. That's uh, that's my closing thought. Is is just I'm I'm so inspired by brothers and sisters who follow Jesus even when it hurts, uh, even when it costs them their freedom, maybe even cost them their life. Um, and so I hope I hope as we've shared today that that our listeners, our our viewers have gotten a little bit inspired, and I hope they'll get more inspired as they hear more stories of persecuted Christians. Well, thank you so much, thank Todd, for joining so us. We've been blessed by just it, what you're doing it it's been my privilege thank you for having me thank you so much for joining us on calvary conversations if you haven't already please make sure to like subscribe and share this video also if you like to listen to us wherever you get your podcast just type in calvary conversations whether that's on spotify or itunes also make sure to give us a five-star review that really helps get this podcast out to the world and we also are just so thankful for you guys sending in questions. You guys can do that on Instagram and follow us at Calvary Conversations. And if you would like us to get more guests like Todd Nettleton, you guys can go to our website, calvaryconversations.com and just put in a special guest speaker that you would like us to have. Or if you have a, sh a story that you would like to share, you guys can do that there. And you would like, if you'd like to donate to this podcast, this is a listener supporter. So you guys can do that in the description below that says donate. Thank you so much guys and God bless.